Linux as my daily driver. Well, it has been for about pushing 10 years now. Uh, I started in her with the desktop environments, uh, using it instead of Windows roughly 10 years ago. Uh, so around 2009, 2010, I, I didn't set that date in a calendar. Uh, and over the years, you go from using Windows to fully using Linux to the point of, I'm a little bit not lost in Windows, but I'm gonna say it feels clunky to me. I still do admin work in Windows for my day-to-day -day business, uh, but I'm not using Windows for it. I'm fixing people's Windows systems, fixing domain controllers, Active Directory, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, people misquote or misstate my intentions thinking I just hate Microsoft. And I, I uh, this is just a flaw people have in tech where they assume if you use one thing, you hate the other thing. Uh, I guess this probably goes outside of tech as well, but a lot of people make that assumption. I don't hate other things. I may choose not to use Windows, but it's not because I hate it. But at Windows, after using Linux, once you get comfortable in that environment, does feel clunky. It is nice though, because Windows has brought many of the features that we've enjoyed in Linux for a very long time to the Windows. Windows 10 platform somewhat. And I'm not gonna get into every little detail on there. And I'm also not gonna lie to you. I do use GIMP for editing. GIMP is not Photoshop. That was probably one of my big challenges that kept me on Windows longer. I used to do a lot of graphic design work and GIMP is not an absolute equivalent to Photoshop. It's very different. Once you get used to GIMP, it's a good tool to learn. It's a good tool to use. I do enjoy it now, um, but there was certainly some pain that uh, took time of reading and watching, which the good news is just search for GIMP tutorial on how to do each thing that you can't figure out how to do, and you'll find many of them on YouTube. Uh, no, I don't have links to them, and they were so long ago. Um, I, I'm not sure which the best video is now for that. I haven't done a lot of research in it. It's kind of a trial and error uh, to get to where I'm at. Back to the topic here. What are my Linux desktop daily use tools that I'm using all the time? What do I load on here? How do I get my job done? How do I get my business up and running? So there's a combination of things here and I'm gonna include uh, some of the business tools I use and the tools I use for video editing because they're kind of one and the same because there is a blend I've had for putting all these YouTube videos out. Yes, I spend at least uh, part of, not every day, but part of the time like today I'm producing a video so I'm gonna be using those tools. I'm going to start with distribution though. And this is where people, when they start out in Linux, get super hung up. They want to know what distro they should use. Now, big fan of Ubuntu, uh, was for a long time. It's kind of a boring distro, but it's a good place to start because it's stable, it works. The drivers work pretty much out of the box for most situations. Then if you want a little more polish, uh, Pop! OS came along. and. So now my recommendation generally for people starting out is go right to Pop! OS. It's Ubuntu with polish. You still get all the benefits of a nice stable base. Not exciting, I said stable, uh, because some people say, but I like the bleeding cutting edge million features I get from insert name of distribution here. Yeah, I get it. And KDE, for example, does have lots of uh, bells and whistles. So it's a popular choice. And I've used KDE uh, for a while. I've used the KDE Neon distribution for a while. Um, I'm to Pop! OS, it just, it works. It works really, really well. The updates are smooth. The uh, whole system, the Pop! Store, everything has just been great. I've got a couple of reviews you can find of Pop! OS, but I'll bring it up and this is particularly running on my uh, Pop! Top 480, which is actually a Lenovo ThinkPad L480 with the i5 8520 uh, UHD 620 graphics. Nothing great here, nothing high end. Uh, this is my, well, this is my only computer I use when I'm not at the office. If I take this home uh, and I need to do technology work at all, it's uh, this here. Now, the reason I bring up the distribution is one of the things I'm gonna pull up right here. I am currently VPN back to my house, but I do have a handful of different VPNs I can hop to, provided I need to be on a VPN. Uh, no special software to load other than, and I've got a video on setting this up, it just load the VPN tools that are built in. Now, I've been a long, long time, over 20 years, Debian user, uh, so I'm really familiar with the Debian environment, and so Debian-based distributions, or Ubuntu uh, as well, all use apt and using the app system does help to get these loaded. That is a little piece of it. And I've got a video that shows how to set the VPNs up in here, but it's really easy to be able just to uh, go in here, set this up and manage the networking on here and jump to uh, different networks. I'm already at the office, so I don't need to do VPN there, but I do VPN back to my house to synchronize certain things or if I need access to things. Now, in the background here, this question comes up a lot because uh, I will I do network engineering and Wi-Fi and this little utility, which I don't know that it needs its own review because it's really basic and simple, but for Wi-Fi scanning, link quality, measuring in real time, 
I've never found a UI, like a whole graphical system that didn't work as good as uh, Wavemon does right here. Uh, Wavemon being essentially, you know, written and working at the command line level here, but you know, graphics adequate enough. I don't think it's one of those things that requires more, but from here I can go in and see things and be able to go, okay, I need a list, I need a scan and be able to see the connections, the connection speed and details about the connection. Uh, pretty straightforward and easy to do because I have those details that you may want. What's the RX rate, uh, the bandwidth, the width of the channel, etc. It's WaveMon, apt get install WaveMon. And of course, like I said, distribution doesn't matter a lot. Uh, if you're using a CentOS based distribution, Red Hat distribution, uh, I believe it's just yum install WaveMon. It's uh, available across a wide variety of platforms. And we're going to do a couple other command line ones. So this is Tmux. I've got a video on getting started with Tmux. And uh, Tmux is great for being able to split the screen, SSH into different things. So another command line app I use would be Tmux. And of course, Vim for editing. I've always just liked Vim when it comes to editing things. Uh, but there is times when I'm not using it. So go over here to downloads folder and uh, actually exit. And we'll see the downloads. Uh, Vim, what is in here? Test, yeah. Vim got all my stuff, how this how is set up. I have a link I have to my GitHub. So you can have your Vim, your command line, everything set up the way I do with my Tmux. All those configs are completely available for free. And anytime I do customization to them, so I'll go to my dot files, git, pull, Cool. All right. I didn't have a uh, change in here. So now I'm to the latest version of Tmux uh, for a change I had made to it in my config file. Git is another thing I have installed on here. And I'm not going to go all command line here in case you're uh, clicking away from this video. Um, but I do use the command line quite a bit and including when I need to pull a project. So our dash F, let's just, whoops. Get rid of everything in my Git and show you how I use Git real quick. So let's go over here and we'll look at this a repository. And I've talked about this as an architecture updater and we'll show you I use Git all the time. And it just makes it really simple. You copy this. We're going to go over here and we're just going to go Git. Whoops, clone, not pull. Clone, drop that in there. And now I've got this added there. So I use Git a lot to grab repositories, projects, uh, different things that I'm working on. It's a really quick way. Once you learn how Git works, and if, you know, uh, CDs and orchestra updater, and if I needed to update this project, you would just go uh, Git pull. So, oops, having trouble typing today. Git pull, pull the latest version. Uh, make sure you always have it up to date. I may do some tutorials on Git. I'm not an absolute expert at it, but it does become very handy when you're doing any type of uh, tooling where you need different updates. Pull it, find a GitHub project, grab the files you need, uh, start running through it real quick, being able to work this from the command line. There are UIs for it, but uh, I've never found the command line that difficult to use. You know, very quickly I can start pulling uh, information here, things I want. Um, and not a big deal. So our F, I always like to keep things clean. Now, I think that's, uh, for the most part, I mean, I could go on and on about command line utilities. And I've got, I think, a couple videos on it. But for the most part, those are the common ones other than looking at things like HTOP, because I want to see what's running and how many processors it's using, et cetera, et cetera, which we already know Chrome's going to be sucking up all the memory. So let's switch over to Chrome. Why do I use Chrome? There's someone shaking their fist at me about this. Uh, Chrome is integrated into Google very well because, well, Google makes it. I know it supports G Suite very, very well. My business life is G Suite. Uh, so people ask, why aren't you? I've had someone ask, why I don't use ProtonMail for business, which kind of was a head scratcher. Maybe I'm unaware that they have some business use case that I don't know. Um, but yes, my business life uh, is in and out of G Suite. That's how we contact clients is using G Suite. It's how we do our uh, management of all of our documents. Even our inbound lead generation is just a series of things on G Suite. And because it's so web enabled, I'm not going to dive deep into you know G Suite, but being web enabled means it doesn't matter if it's on Linux or Windows. The platform's the same because it's all done in a browser. Matter of fact, this is one of those things where more and more things have moved to the browser, including, well, Zen Orchestra, and allows me to, you know, full VM management all through a web browser where I can spin up and set up and configure uh, virtual machines, migrate and move them, and all through a web interface so I have no applications to load. Matter of fact, the more things that load, that I can load through a web browser generally make me happy because I don't have to load software on my computer. And I only have one platform to update. When I update Zen Orchestra to the latest version, me and and every one of my texts that log into it always are saying the same thing with the same version. That goes to our invoicing software. Yes, I still use Invoice Ninja. Once again, web enabled. 
being able to do that. Uh, all of our invoicing and automation of payments all through a web-enabled platform means nothing loaded on there. Now, I will cover, because on the topic of finance, K-My-Money. Uh, this is cross-platform, by the way. I'm running it in Linux, but you can run this in Windows. This has been what's managed my company's uh, money for, well, I think I started using it in 2013. Um, and I've really, really enjoyed it. I'm not a QuickBooks fan at all. I know QuickBooks has a web-enabled uh, platform. I'm just not a fan. And My Money, I have a video on this. I need to probably do a new one because Cave My Money has gone through a lot of versions and had some updates uh, and it keeps getting better. But it functionally, if you dig around and find, well, I'm probably one of the few people I think I've seen that's done a video on Cave My Money. It's this simple process of um, you get bank files, I import them in and do an alignment of all those bank files from each one of my bank accounts and drop them into to do my P&L, transaction lists, et cetera, et cetera, and understand how the business is. Uh, well, it's as they may call them KPI or key performance indicators of your business and also money management. I need to figure out where all the money is because uh, the IRS cares greatly about that and uh, making sure all of this information is properly put together is really, really important. So I've been using K My Money, like I said, for quite a while. Now, how do I sync all this? Because obviously I'm using my laptop, but I probably do this on my desktop too, right? You gotta have that backed up. And I'll just throw up sync thing. I've done several videos on this. Sync thing is my favorite way to do this. I know a lot of people are big, big fans of own cloud. And to me, I like keeping my threat surface much, much reduced. We load sync thing on a couple systems. We sync it across a VPN, which that's why it says this is disconnected now. If I open the VPN back up, it'll reconnect. Um, I have it connected to the, you know, so it's all going through encrypted tunnels. But by the way, sync thing also sends things over an encrypted transport layer. Uh, so it's not like a huge worry, but hey, why even have things exposed? But this allows me and my staff, we just load sync thing. We have a shared documents repository uh, that we know is very locked down and private and not shared with any third party and also synced off site. This is, uh, I've done several videos, like I said, so I won't dive too in depth on it, but it works really, really well uh, for keeping everything in sync. And it's really lightweight, as you can see here, using all of 39 megs of my 16 gigs of RAM to keep on this particular uh, same about four gigs files, 2,090 files all in sync. And there's more on different systems in our office and outside for uh, synchronization. So let me close that. All right. Now getting back to GIMP. So GIMP is not Photoshop. It is not a replacement for Photoshop. Uh, where are my text features and all this fun stuff? I don't know, I don't see them because they don't exist in GIMP. They just are missing some features. It is a learning curve. It is not like you just need to learn how to do this compared to Photoshop. And I say that because I was a long time Photoshop user and it took me a long time to get off Windows because of Photoshop. And I used to just run Photoshop in a VM for a number of years until I just forced myself to learn GIMP. Once I've learned it, yes, pretty much most all, every video thumbnail for the last maybe two years or longer has been published by GIMP um, and edited by GIMP. So most of my channel is done with this as part of my open source workflow uh, is using GIMP. Now, produ producing the video, as a matter of fact, this video itself is being produced on OBS. You don't see it running on the laptop because it actually runs on a studio computer and I will cringe a little. Yes, I use Windows on the studio computer because it just works better because of the little switch box that I have right here. I've talked about that in my studio video for those wondering. So I use OBS to record when I'm recording in my office studio um, versus when I'm recording here. So I do have OBS installed on my laptop, but I don't record it as frequently for my laptop, but when I do live streams, it is there. So OBS is great, the open source version, but then I do use Windows on the machine that's actually recording and connected to the camera because it works a lot better with this. Yes, there's a Python library. Yes, I'm aware of it. Uh, it needs to get better. <laughs> so we'll just throw that out there. It's okay. Now, file management. The file management's actually not that big of a deal to me using the built-in file manager for here for Pop! OS. It works great. I don't have a problem with it. It allows me to have SSH connections into different things. I can just quickly go here and go uh, SFTP, whoops, colon slash slash and jump right into, uh, let's go to Dozer. And now I can SFTP into that particular machine. I already have my SSH keys in because, and I haven't done a deep dive of this when you SSH, which I would say it seems obvious because it's built in, but it is one of the utilities I use a lot. So if I were to go to SSH Dozer, the way that auto completes is in your SSH uh, directory. Let me exit out cd.ssh. Oh, in this, uh, uh, we got to start from the command line, cd.ssh. 
SSH, you will see a right here a uh, file for authorized keys and uh, public key authentication is what I use. And then inside of there, uh, is it dot config? All right, and what you're seeing here, I just want to make sure I, I show exactly how it's doing it. So I LSLA uh, config is a symbolic link to Tom LTS bash scripts, Tom SSH config. And what this actually is, is just my simple way of any time I add a server and I'm not going to list them all in there. It's got a lot of uh, servers and information. And I'm going to do a separate video on SSH and how the config files work. This allows me to have properly named systems in there and then sync those systems, uh, especially when I'm working on a project, I just drop them in there real quick, but they in turn work in hand in hand with the same names that you have when you're in the file manager, which is kind of cool. So you see it here as tank. Now, another side of this is what about window shares? Well, that's pretty easy too. So SMB 192.168.3.4, if we're doing an SMB share, we go to the studio folder. I'm going to connect anonymously, but I could have logged in with the login. And here's some of the files that are in the studio share. This is an SSH one and they all get mounted. And then you can go through a tabbed view. So open tab videos, go here, I can now copy and paste them between here or even open tab again, et cetera, et cetera. And this nice tab view makes it really easy to manage a bunch of things that I have open uh, and manipulate files. And a lot of my manipulation of those files is, you know, dragging them into Caden Live. Caden Live, definitely an app I love to use. Uh, it is how almost all of the videos on this channel are done. The first handful of videos, I used a tool called OpenShot. I just didn't feel robust enough. Caden Live is amazing. I'm gonna do some more videos because they keep coming up with uh, more and more versions. I've definitely donated a few times and uh, helping out with what they refer to as their code sprint and trying to get more features in there. And then people will right away compare this to um, some of the more premium expensive open, non-open source editing platforms. No, it's not gonna be as full features in them, but for my channel and what I do, I'm not a person who needs lots of advanced effects. I just don't bother putting them on my channel because I don't think there would be any value add to um, what I do. This works great. I have some videos where I spent a little bit more time in production and those were also produced with Caden Live. And once you kind of learn the nuances of what you have to do in Caden Live, uh, it, works, it works pretty well uh, for getting things done. But yeah, it is not going to be, it's not like any of the premium products out there that are for pay. Um, but it, like I said, look at my channel, um, you'll see what I've done with it. And pretty much anything in the last two years has 100% in the last two years, maybe in the last three years has been produced. Probably the last three years have been produced with Caden Live. Uh, definitely a great program. And yes, that's my Tesla on there. Um, I got more Tesla videos I've been wanting to do. I've actually shot a bunch of stuff for it. I just haven't had a time to do all the editing. This is actually in the fall and yes, it's the winter now. So yes, I'm behind on those. Those are sometimes harder for me to produce. Now behind that is Genie. Love Genie. This is a great tool. Matter of fact, um, if we go over here, uh, what do we have that we can drag in here? So Genie will let us do code editing. So let me go over here. Yes, I like Vim, but you know, hey, sometimes you want to do something a little bit nicer and not well, we erase that. So let's just look in the downloads folder. We'll drag in a GNLP file. You can see it can do the formatting and everything else. It looks pretty nice. And actually, uh, let's go back over here real quick. Let's clone something there. So uh, let's do that. We'll go over to Git. Whoops. Clone that in there real quick so we have some files. Home, Git. And then from here, we're gonna go and uh, let's just pull the these two files in there, just drag them in here. Hey, look how we can jump from section to section on this. Genie's just really nice for doing this. Definitely handles it well so I can find files, search and replace, pull things out of there. It recognizes a large variety of uh, formats. So you can go through here, reload as, uh, recent files, new template, HTML, Python, Java, so many different options in here, which I really like. So it's, uh, like I said, a very great tool for doing this. And when you're doing a search and replace, you can do things globally, document only, sections only, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it does have hooks to build things and tie into more uh, more development that I don't usually do. Mostly I'm just editing config files and this is a quick way to do it. Especially uh, I've, anytime you've probably seen me do videos on how to do some raw editing on like a PFSense, I'm 
Genie's kind of my go-to uh, easy way to do it. Vim is too, uh, but Genie's a little bit nicer in terms of being able to, you know, work it all in the GUI here. VirtualBox, love VirtualBox. I've got a couple of videos on this. I still use it. Zen Orchestra and Zen Server, maybe for my back end and stuff we do for a lot of clients. But on the other side of that, um, stuff I need to do locally, which the only thing I even lo loaded on here at the moment is Tails when I was doing some playing with the latest version on there. Um, this is great. I usually have a few other things loaded, but then I delete them because this computer is fast, but not super fast. So what I'll do is I'll update them on my main workstation and then re-import them. So this is that in-between where I purged them and then I'll import uh, a Windows VM. Sometimes I need to spin that up when I'm at a client and it's nice to have that. So I can snapshot it, run a Windows VM, pass things through as needed. It does have USB pass-through support. Um, usually not necessary. Usually I just have to run some application, which I can create a snapshot. So I would load something and then just the snapshot or special thing I had to do for the client. So no big deal there. Uh, VirtualBox is free. It works great. I don't even bother loading the extra enhanced extensions that I know are proprietary and uh, apparently somewhat controversial because I know they're trying to get people for license fees for it. Now, one of the other things is Shutter. I love Shutter. Now I know other people will talk about, and I've, I've used it. Um, have you tried Tom Flameshot? Yes, Flameshot is pretty neat. But I'm not the biggest fan of it. Flameshot is kind of cool. It adds some context and things like that. Maybe it needs its own video at some point. But Flameshot's eh, just not my favorite when it comes to uh, grabbing these things. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even show in the bar here, does it? Nope, it's hidden. There's a way I could probably display it, but I don't care enough. Uh, with Shutter, on the other hand, I do this all the time. This is my favorite thing to do with Shutter. I do this. I click Edit. I go to this and I tell people, this is where you're supposed to click. This is so frequently things I post on, well, replies to messages and stuff like that. People always ask me questions. You'll see this in the forums. I'll just throw a couple arrows on there or throw a couple texts over there. Um, I also frequently, to remove location type data uh, that I may have, that's why there's a screenshot in here of something else. I'll take a picture and I know I can strip it out. I just frequently will grab a screenshot with shutter of a picture of a thing. Uh, also, it allows me to do that same thing. I can quickly go in and uh, grab it and then mark it up and be like, I'm pointing at this. You know what I mean? And then uh, you kind of get the idea. I can quickly edit something. Or the other thing you do with Shutter that is frequently done is this right here. It has a blur tool. So I'm like, well, that's private information we're going to hide. And now I have part of it hidden, an arrow pointed to what I want to point to. And then this gets posted. You'll see me post these on Twitter all the time. Um, Twitter or any other social media platform or just in forums, replies, I'm, when I'm in discussions with people like, hey, click here, click here, or I'll show something out of my um, system, but I don't want to share per certain personal information out, but show people where how to do something. So that works really well. A couple other things I will mention, and uh, we're going to scroll down here real quick. I sometimes do like ZenMap. Um, I, know, I do know how to use ZenMap from the command line. ZenMap makes it easy. It's simple. Um, yeah, you're not running as root. It does work better if you run as root, but you can throw a target in here, do a quick scan, and uh, 3.1 to 200. And we'll just do a quick scan, scan, and you can start building data information uh, very quickly, host services, et cetera, et cetera. And hey, cool, we know what's open on this particular network, ports, host, topology, and you can start diving into this real quick and then save this file, send it out, and start processing and enumerating a network very, very quickly. I just uh, started enumerating all this information in here. So it works pretty well for that. I'm gonna close anyways. So ZenMap is in there, and so is Wireshark. Uh, Wireshark is really a great go-to when you're trying to do network diagnostics. Uh, it needs its own video, but a lot of people are familiar with it. Look it up. Uh, Wireshark, just like I said, dive into it and uh, great for doing network packet analysis. A couple runners up on here. I mean, they're important to me because I use them. We do our communication through Signal. And I, one of the important things, I have a review of Signal. I probably should do an updated review they've added so many features, is uh, when I communicate with people, I don't necessarily want it all to be perfect uh forever permanent records, I should say, of things. So I use Signal to create ephemeral messages. And what I mean by that is even discussions I have with my wife or kids or whatever, I like them to be encrypted um, because I can, not even because there's something super to hide, but it's my 
choice and my opportunity, my ability to use encryption, therefore I do. And I like those information to expire. So I set timers on all of it. I always set messages to expire 24 hours, 48 hours, etc. cetera. Uh, you can do that in Signal and it works really, really well. And it's a great way to have encrypted communications. We've encouraged tons of our clients to use it so we can message them via Signal and be able to you know, have it encrypted if we wanna send them a piece of information, not through text. And Signal does tie to your cell phone, which uh, does bother some people because then you do have to reveal your cell phone number. Yeah, but I'm talking about communications between personal friends. And the last one, I'm not going to pull it up because there's a ton of private messages in there that does not require you to divulge your cell phone number is going to be Keybase. I have a review of that. I need to do an updated one. They've done an amazing job of adding features of it. Keybase is great. I, uh, it, it has become a go-to for group conversations that I can also know are encrypted and ephemeral, which I want them to disappear as well. VG, uh, when me and Xavier, for example, we have a couple groups and I have several um, hacking discussions going on and we like those messages. They don't need to be dug up five years from now or permanently in there. We share what information you want. If there's some nugget of information or we share a GitHub repository, I don't use my chat as some deep reference because that's clunky uh, to go, oh, remember, I remember like six months ago, you mentioned it. Let me search for every GitHub link you ever threw in there. No, no, no. I pull those out, star the repositories, follow them where I want to follow them on GitHub. Um, I pull the information that's relevant out. I know the rest will expire. That discussion we had can expire. I'm fine with that. There's enough permanent record of my uh, online activity kept everywhere else. And as I kind of stated uh, several times, and once again here, um, I have, this is all we're talking about is my business life, not my personal life. My personal life would be separate and I use other browsers for that. That's one of the ways you can keep a clear separation between uh, business and personal. That's a different topic. And I'm actually personally not online as much or as uh, present. This is Talking to you on YouTube is still part of my business life, I consider it. Um, but I just want to do this video, talk about the daily usage on there. I, I don't have any problem running my business on this. Um, a couple other mentions are like, yes, we still use SolarWinds, which is web-based, so I can manage client systems and that. Um, so much of my job is spent doing network engineering or working on servers for clients. You're just SSHing in and stuff like that. Uh, for remote access, uh, we like... Screen Connect, we've been using it, ConnectWise Control for a long, long time. It is cross-platform in both ways. Not only can I support people using other platforms, even though I'm using Linux, the reverse is true. I can connect to Linux boxes if I need to, so people running Linux can connect with Screen Connect and go out and um, remote control that way as well. Uh, that's the platform we're using for that. I think that's it for the list. I can leave links down below, but... Um, yeah, this is all great tools. And I, like I said, I don't have any problem with uh, doing daily usage on Linux. Been doing it for years, it's not been a problem. It's how I run my business. Um, it's not really been an issue for those times. I do, there are always some special one-offs, like I said, that do require Windows. For example, we have a couple of clients that use a very specific Cisco VPN. Yes, we spin up a virtual box that we have on our server that we then remote into to get to the client's network because they only support getting in via the Cisco app that they have. Um, and it just doesn't work right in Linux, so therefore, that system is designed for that. Those are the one-off use cases. Yeah, that's why VirtualBox is installed in here and that's why we do, only time we really have to use Windows in here is when we're doing that type of one-off work. And I will at least mention, uh, as people are gonna ask about, but Tom, don't you play any games? Yes, I do. One of my favorite games that I play and we'll at least show this, give, you know, just so you know, I do play some. I, I don't have Steam on here. I actually don't really play any games that aren't in a repository. Um, uh, so, but this one, I, I got a thing for Tetris and, uh, this is great. It's, uh, I think it's called Bass, Bash Tris. It's, uh, Bash Testris. It's, um, great. I, I, I can sit and play this for a while if I'm stuck somewhere waiting for something and, um, I don't have, I don't feel like reading. This is just a great way where you're waiting for a circuit to turn up to, uh, kill a little bit of time. So with that, I'll leave you and I'm going to go play some Tetris because once I start, I can't just end. I got to play it more and more. All right. Thanks. And thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more content from the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the bell icon if you'd like YouTube to notify you when new videos come out. If you'd like to hire us, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out our contact page, and let us know what we can help you with and what projects you'd like us to work together on. If you want to carry on the discussion, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can carry on the discussion about this video, other videos, or other tech topics in general, even suggestions for new videos. They're accepted right there on our forums, which are free. Also, if you'd like to help the channel out in other ways, head over to our affiliate page. We have a lot of great tech offers for you. And once again, thanks for watching and see you next time.